What's going on everybody? It's your boy JB and I'm here with a special guest, Miguel. And I forgot what his title is already. And we're going to talk about <laughs> Crown Head Cigars all next on the Zeal Cigar Review. So, Miguel, yes, sir. who are you and what do you do with Crown Heads and Ozinger Cigars? So, I'm the National Sales Manager okay. with Crown Heads and Oz Family Cigars. I've been in the business 21 years, uh, very proud to have worked with the same group of guys for almost all those years. Oh, wow. Mike Condor, okay. John Huber, and Tim Osgener, just three legends of the cigar industry. And uh, I head up their sales, I head up their international sales, I head up our sales team. It's a lot of fun, and sometimes I can't believe I've been doing it 21 years. Yeah, tw you know, 21 years with the same cigar company company is probably almost as good as like somebody like Michael Jordan spent in their most of their career with the same team. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, you in this industry, hear about it. no, a lot of people are always switching, yeah, right? You so don't. I worked for CAO and the Osgeners own CAO and now they own Crown Heads and ah. Oz Family. So it may not be the same brand, but it's the same group of guys. I didn't know they used to own CAO. Yes, yeah, we owned CAO in 1968. We sold it in 07 and we ran it until 2010. And then after it was handed off, then in 2011, we founded Crown Heads and Oz Family Cigars. Okay. And Osgener, Tim Osgener, I mean, his last name sometimes is hard for be able to pronounce so I've always shortened it to just Oz, Oz family, Oz yeah, family yeah, yeah. cigars. So yeah. And actually I'm smoking one of those cigars that has been something that's been growing on me because uh Craig has been coming around the shop a lot and slinging this thing like like a butcher slings meat. <laughs> and um I've I've really enjoyed it. And that's the uh the Aramis, right? Or yes. Aramis. Aramis. Uh there's different ways you could pronounce it, but that's the Oz family Aramis. So Tim had put out the Bosphorus as his first release. Um, all of his blends are made by Ernesto Perez Carrillo down at okay. Casa Carrillo in the Dominican. He put out the Bosphorus, 93 rated, top notch, and that has an Ecuador Habano 2000 wrapper. So he wanted his second release to be something in a Maduro format, right? So this is a deep, dark Mexican San Andreas Maduro wrapper incredible blend. It's got some really good stout meaty characteristics. Um, I always swing in meat. Yeah, and, and it's funny, I always try to compare a cigar to a food item. Okay. And so for me, almost like a beef jerky. It's got that okay. meaty characteristic okay. to it. And then he just put out his third core brand called First Sot, which is a Connecticut, which is a smooth, mild, um, mild to medium cigar. Okay. And uh, you're smoking an Oz, and yeah. I am smoking. I'm going to do what you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I am See smoking. See if you can get it to do it without the hand. Brad always had to use the hand. There you go. Almost. I'm not... Oh, there we go. That is yeah. our Mel Diaz Habano. It also comes in a Maduro version as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to ask about that, but first, we have to do something else real quick. Yes, sir. And we have to figure out what these cigars taste like. You know there's only one way we can find out what these cigars taste like. You guys know what we got to do. We got to cut, light, and smoke, baby. My oh, man. Sometimes people just don't get that part right. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Just, they don't, they don't so get the smoke part right. You're using a V-cut, I've noticed. I'm a huge V-cut fan for probably two reasons. Okay. I'm, I'm a, a guillotine guy. I'm a biter. Ah, okay. Right, so biting down on this usually isn't as bad as biting down on a guillotine cut with yep. all the open tobacco. Mm -hmm. I don't get as yep. much in my mouth. Yep. Um, and I personally feel like I have less issues with a wrapper ever coming off because it usually gets cut off at one point and yep. it doesn't unravel all the way. And here in Arizona, when you're going from 70 and 70 in a humidor and you're walking outside and it's 120 outside. Yeah. These things sometimes are a little finicky. It's just, well, it's you gotta dry box them or something. I, you know? I, I am a guillotine guy. The, the guillotine is the original cutter, right? It has been around forever. It can cut bellicosos, torpedoes, figurados, parejos, box press. It's great. The guillotine, I think, is more of a specialty. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm a V cut guy, but what I, what I do like about the guillotine, or the, the V-cut, yeah. they've gotten better over the years. Oh, that the thing's... original V-cuts were so shallow. <laughs> now they've got these deeper Vs that actually, like that, I mean, yeah. that, that's a deep V. And, bef and, and 10 years ago, the, the V-cuts were not very good. This is a great V-cut you have on there. And what is nice about it, from a cigar maker's perspective, they work very hard on making the head of the cigar perfect. Okay. And that maintains some of their art and craftsmanship. That because okay. you still see the head of the cigar. So I don't. I didn't think about that. It, it maintains that beautiful head that they work so hard on in making that cigar. The guillotine completely takes it off, but it does look good. It's more. 
as long as cigars have been around, V cuts have, are one of the younger uh, known cuts for a cigar. But I will say that it, it's got its place, and it has definitely got its time in the light right now. Yeah, I don't. Um, I would say like I, I use a punch if I'm on like a golf course because mm. I like to carry a lighter that just has a punch on it, mm -hmm. and then I just bring a lighter or. I'll smoke a cigar that has a pigtail and you just bite the pigtail off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Super easy to do that. Yeah, we call that a, a Nicaraguan cut, where you just pinch it or, or bite the <laughs> end off. Because when we're down in the factories, I mean, it's like there's no use to have a cutter. Just You pinch it off or whatever, you know what I mean? I have a customer that just takes her teeth mm -hmm. and just punctures it with her teeth and yeah. just smokes it. You, like, you, she's, she used to be a drill sergeant in the Well, military, listen, you gotta so. be you got to have some skills with that, you know what I mean? Uh, I ruined when I try to use my, my mouth. But when I'm down at the factories, either it be Dominican or Nicaragua, you know, the cigar guys down there, none of them are using cutters. They're all just pinching the caps off a cigar. But um, so what you're smoking there is this beautiful blend. There's Nicaraguan, there's Dominican, there's um, some broadleaf in the filler, which is always used as yeah. a wrapper. So that's unique. And it's a Mexican San Andres. Again, made by Ernesto Perez Carrillo, the godfather of boutique cigar brands. He is a Hall of Famer and, and a cigar aficionado mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. Um, him and Tim Osgren, their relation goes, relationships go back decades. And so when Tim came back to the industry with his family brand, he really wanted to work with someone that he loved and respected. And so that's why his first three core brands and limited edition Pais and Estacia's all been through Ernesto Thank Perez Carrillo. And what yeah. you're smoking there is something you guys have on the shelf here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I'm smoking our Mil Diaz, which is Crown Heads, which is made in a little factory called Tacanixa, Nicaragua. And it's Ecuador Habano wrapper, Nicaraguan, Peruvian, Pero de Oro tobacco, and a salty Costa Rican tobacco as well. Yeah, you, you guys are one of the few, in my personal opinion, that figured out how to use Costa Rican tobacco the mm. right way. Mm. Um, the only other person that I've heard kind of... Um, talk about Costa Rican tobacco in, in a similar way was Michael Herklotz. Oh yeah, Michael was like, it's like salt when you're cooking. Yes. You use too much, your food tastes like yeah. crap. You use yeah. too much, your food tastes boring. Yeah, and it I, could be a flavor enhancer. Yeah, like I think yeah. you guys did something really unique with, with the blend of that Peruvian and kind of bringing out a really unique sweet and salty and a little spice out of that cigar. So Graham crackery almost. The Nicaraguan tobacco in this cigar Nicaraguan tobacco can be known for a little bit being a little bit more potent. Mm -hmm. The Peruvian Pero de Oro that we're using, Pero de Oro means golden hairs, it's a small tobacco plant, it doesn't yield a lot of tobacco, so it's not a leaf that's being grown by a lot of people, but it has an incredible, almost caramel-like notes to the tobacco. Easily could be overpowered by the Nicaraguan fillers that we're using in this cigar. So how do you how do you fight that? Well, yeah. we use a little bit of the salty Costa Rican tobacco that allows you to salivate and pick up the notes of the Pero de Oro through the Nicaraguan tobacco. So it's almost put together, almost like a sommelier would pair a wine with a meal. Okay, it's about the tobaccos marrying and working together to really kind of enhance each other. Now the Maduro version of this is very different. Yeah, you, uh, Kevin, my part-time guy, gave you a little bit of a <laughs> hard time about that because that, that Mil Diaz is his favorite cigar. So when yeah. he found out that the new Mil Diaz was a completely different blend mm -hmm. with with because uh, he was kind of expecting maybe it was just going to be yeah. the same blend with the Maduro a wrapper, wrapper right? Yeah, yeah. And then when it was a completely different blend, he was kind of like, oh yeah. no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe even predisposition uh, that he wasn't going to enjoy the cigar as much as the original, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But you gave a really good answer that I really respected, and um, I'm actually probably going to learn from, and I kind of wanted you to share that. Yeah. So when we were working on another blend with uh, John Huber was working on another blend with Aradio uh, to come out of the Tacanixa factory in Nicaragua, we were working on this Maduro cigar and and you know the idea was let's do a Miltius Maduro and what happened was just because you change the wrapper it doesn't mean that wrapper is going to complement the tobaccos in the filler that you already have so that's why sometimes just throwing a Cameroon on a blend or changing to a Connecticut sometimes they just don't pair up yeah and so what we found and what what John Huber found was let's change the filler we took out the Peruvian Pedro de Oro we took out the Costa Rican put in things like Esteli from Nicaragua, Jalapa from Nicaragua, and Ometepe the, oh, from Ometepe is amazing tobacco. It, it, okay, so it, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but if I remember correctly, Ometepe is a really unique island that's in the middle of a freshwater lake. It's a volcanic in island in Lake Nicaragua. Okay. Uh, the only what's unique uh, is a little uh, uh, fun fact is that the only freshwater shark lives in Lake Nicaragua. It's, what? Yeah, it's very unique. It's very unique, but it's a volcanic island. Like you steal my tobacco, you yeah. go to the shark. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so there's Ometepe in the um, Osgener Bosphorus blend as well. Okay. And so Ometepe, they've grown tobacco there for hundreds of years. But as far as the premium cigar industry goes, it's a rather newer tobacco yeah. that's being used. And so over the last 20 years, you've seen Ometepe slowly work itself in because the original regions were Esteli, Jalapa, and Ometepe, uh, and, uh, Jalapa, uh, um, Esteli and Condega. Condega. And so okay. Ometepe has almost become like a fourth region. And so this tobacco is something that not everyone uses, not everyone's able to get their hands on, but we're very proud of that tobacco being able to get our hands on it. And so we're using it in the Mil Dias Maduro blend, use it in the Bosphorus as well. And um, and so those tobaccos tasted better with the broadleaf that we're using on the Mil Dias Maduro. Now, as a company, do you launch a new brand with a new name and you got to educate people on a new brand or do you use, use the name Mil Diaz, which has been very successful, that people can recognize, and you just bless it with that same name? Yeah. So you have the Mil Diaz Habana, which I'm smoking, and then this blend that is completely different. It comes out of the same factory, the same master blender. Let's complement the cigar by giving it the name Mil Diaz. It's worthy yeah. enough of that. So on the shelf, you see the Mil Diaz Maduro, the Mil Diaz Habano. They may look similar, but they are two completely different blends, and they share a name but they have their own unique characteristics. And yep. sometimes, you know, in this business, we're driven by the art of creating. We're driven by the art of flavor, the craftsmanship of that. And sometimes there is a marketing side to even art. Absolutely. And so having a cigar on the shelf with the name Mil Diaz, having two cigars on the shelf with the name Mil Diaz, is not a bad thing. Yeah, no, I I enjoy both cigars too. I think I think both cigars are great. The Maduro's been doing extremely well for you guys from my understanding. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've, I've been impressed with most of the stuff I've smoked from uh, Crown Heads, I can honestly Thank say. You. Thank you. We're yeah. very proud of the people we work with. I mean, our manufacturing partners, EPC, uh, Don Pepin Garcia from the My Father yep. Cigar Factory, Takanixa, Radio Pichardo, and Noxa, Gus Gura down at Noxa, who does some really, really great cigars uh, for us as well. Those manufacturing partners of ours, um, we're very blessed to have, you know, and those relationships we rely on for great tobacco, great manufacturing, great quality. And then when you put out in the world, you hope that the consumer connects with it. Yeah. And luckily, you know, as a company that has its roots back to 1968, even though the company Crown Heads and Oz is established in 2011, our roots go much deeper, right? It's, it's, it's incredible to work with great people that have the same same capacity and craftsmanship and quality and passion, you know, and yeah. passion to put out the product. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I can see that for sure with uh, with the cigars that you guys put out. One hundred percent. I've like this this thing right here. Like it's so nutty, mm -hmm. and then you get that like you said, you get that kind of meaty smokiness mm -hmm. and like a little bit of like a wood twinge, but it's smooth. It's easy on the retrohale. There's not a lot of um, tingle on the palate. It's it's a very delight. I, I would. It's funny that it's made by EP, because I would almost say if I blindfolded somebody with mm -hmm. like a Jaime Garcia, mm -hmm. it's very similar to that, but sweeter. Mm. That's all. Awesome. I think. That's a compliment. I, I That's think a... it's sweeter. Well, you know, it's 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 when you're working with a guy like Ernesto Perez Carrillo. I mean, the guy's a legend. And, but Tim brings his palate in his years because, you know, Tim, Tim Osgener grew up in the cigar industry with his father, the pipe and cigar industry. And so you have these two very different people working on a blend and coming up with something very special. And Aramas, I think, is, is, is that in, in spades. And I do think that that nuttiness characteristic is something that is very enjoyable in the palate. And if you're smoking cigars, leather, nuttiness, Coffee-like notes are very prominent in almost all cigars, but then there's other little hints and things that can go into Cocoa, a cigar. So this has, cinnamon. yeah, yeah, this has a nice little, yeah. there's a little twang to the cigar there's a little that spice, people really, yeah. really like. Yeah, almost, almost cinnamony, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's it's close to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe like nutmeg. So I would I would say that that little baseline of almost cinnamon-like characteristics come from that wrapper. The San Andreas. The San I would Andreas. agree with that. Yep. They. Uh, we used to have a cigar called the Rhapsody. Mm -hmm. That was a box press San Andreas. Oh, nice! And that thing was cinnamon, almost all the way through. Mm -hmm. It was really, really cool. So yeah, I'm I, San Andreas is probably my favorite. One of my favorite tobaccos. Yeah. Broadleaf, anything broadleaf. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what? So, what's your favorite cigar that you guys manufacture? And what's your favorite tobacco? So Mil Diaz is my favorite cigar. I that like the one you're this one. I'm smoking. Yeah, yeah, so. Okay. I smoke a lot. I like to smoke every day. I like to smoke multiple cigars a day. And smoking a really full-bodied cigar is not my favorite. 
smoking a really uber mild cigar is not my favorite. Fair. So Mil Diaz to me hits that middle middle strength and middle body because strength and body are two different things. Yes. You can have a medium bodied cigar that's full in strength. You can have a, and vice versa. And so Mil Diaz is a cigar I can smoke any time of the day, early in the morning, late at night. I just enjoy it. It's my favorite. My favorite tobacco. It's tough. I think that Nicaraguan Jalapa is the base of any great cigar. Okay. I think Nicaraguan Jalapa tobacco, you're in this beautiful valley, you have the mountains surrounding Jalapa, you have the, the coffee in the in the in the mountains, and all that runoff and nutrients from the coffee plants, you know, filter into the valley where the tobacco is being grown, and you just have this incredible rich coffee-like note um, to the tobacco that's grown in Jalapa. And I and I would say that maybe on its own you wouldn't make a cigar that's a Puro out of Jalapa, but what's great is any great Nicaraguan cigar, usually at the base, at the heart of that cigar, is Jalapa tobacco okay. from Nicaragua. So that, that's that's my favorite, and they grow all different types of seed strains in Jalapa, but you know, your typical Habano seed grown in Jalapa and grown in direct sunlight, I think is, is excellent. As far as a wrapper goes, I do think San Andreas is such a great, great tobacco for a wrapper. And I actually like San Andreas when they also put it on sometimes a milder cigar, so you can really taste that wrapper. Yes, uh, but I, I love, I love, I'm, I love Mexican San Andreas. I'm a, I wish, you know, there's so many regions of. That's like Kevin found some African company that was making tobacco out. Where were they making it out of? Well, we know that they grow tobacco in Cameroon. They grow tobacco in Central African Republic as well. Um, but I heard that there's growing tobacco in Zimbabwe and That's, a few other it places. It was Zimbabwe. Well. Yeah. I think it was Zimbabwe. It was Zimbabwe. Yeah. That tobacco was very unique. And then I think CAO just used some of it in the Thunder Smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit different flavor there than, than, than what I remember from the cigars that I have had from Africa. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, they. Uh, the thing is that tobacco it's grows so, everywhere. Yeah, it's so it, interesting. You can the plant the tobacco seed. tobacco is so you, good. You can grow it in your backyard in England. You can grow it in your backyard in Russia. You can grow tobacco anywhere. It's a native to the Americas. It's an American tobacco plant. It is indigenous to the Americas. The Europeans didn't see tobacco until 1492 because it was indigenous to this part of the world. And so when they discovered tomatoes and potatoes and all these different corn, things, they just, yeah. corn, they discovered tobacco as well. And... Um, and tobacco is a, a seed that can grow pretty much anywhere. And so wherever you grow it, it definitely takes on those flavor profile and characteristics from the soil. And so you can grow the same tobacco seed strain in Zimbabwe, in Russia, in Nicaragua, and get three completely different tasting tobaccos from the same seed strain. So the world, never-ending amounts of varieties you're going to be able to taste. So the more countries they grow it in, the more blending opportunities that we all have. You See, know, I love not, that. It's not just Cuba, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Dominican, um, Honduras. Cuba, and Honduras anymore. Now it's 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 being grown all over the world. Yeah, I, man. See, that's that's one of the things I love about cigars is it, it really could be a never-ending art form. I 100%. With the way the fermenting, the way the blending, the way that you could... Uh, that's that's something people don't realize, the, that the, the fermentation. fermentation, the way you ferment and the way I ferment, we could start with the same tobacco, but the way our, the way we learned from our, the people that we learned from, we may ferment completely different. Yeah. And, and how long we ferment, and then how long we age, and how we age a tobacco. You can get two completely. I always say the great thing when I'm explaining cigars to people, I always say is if you're a chef and I'm a chef, and you give us the same 25 ingredients, we can complete. We can make two completely different. Oh, 100 percent. And yet we started with the same ingredients, but it's different. This, different that. Our different cooking techniques. A little bit less of this. And a that's bit where more you that. get the variety and the great cigar makers, the Ernesto Perez Carrillos of the world, the uh, Don Pepins of the world can start with a lot of the same tobacco, but end up with a completely different product at the end of the day. You know, I think that, when, so when I traveled to Europe, I uh, go down this little path for a minute here. That I think that's what surprised me the most is some people almost scoff at New World Tobacco. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you don't understand what you're missing. That's like, that's yep. like saying like, you know, I only watch movies from you know, the, the 1500s that are in black and white yeah, movie yeah, yeah, picture. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> I, I'm not a big CGI fan yeah, personally, yeah, 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 but like, yeah. you don't know what you're missing 
from well, film now yeah. compared to what so that's, film was before. That's right? always like, the argument right now in the film world, right? It's like you have these guys that are more artsy kind of movie yeah. people and they get mad that Marvel's so popular. Right. <laughs> but then, but also wine. You gotta remember, I remember, I wanna say, and maybe my buddy Craig, who's our regional rep here, maybe he can correct me. He knows a little more about wine than I do. But when uh, Stag is Leap, uh, they, California wine, this may have been in the 70s, maybe, maybe the 80s, there was a blind tasting of wine oh, broken. in France, you know, and Italy would turn their nose up against wine from the United States. And I never, this is probably in the 70s or 80s where Stag's Leap, or California wine, took the number one. Oh, and so. In Europe, they're so used to Cuban cigars. But I get it. I get why they turn their I, nose up because they're not familiar yet. I know. But more so now than ever before, countries like Germany, places like the UK, um, the Netherlands, Belgium, these places are opening their door to New World cigars and they're falling in love with Nicaragua, Dominican, Honduras, and that's incredible. They're discovering that. And and maybe that'll happen to us if Cuban cigars ever become legal here. A lot of people are going to go, hey, I want to try a Cuban cigar. I've never tried a Cuban cigar. And that, we get them in, and we and, and the only thing that can make you better as a person who enjoys food, who enjoys bourbon or cigars, try more. is to try more and to, and, to, and to train your palate on new flavors and things like that. So, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, man, it's, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to meet people. Like when I meet uh, this happens a lot when I'm in Detroit or in Buffalo. I'll meet Canadians, and I'll meet young Canadian cigar smokers who go, "Listen, my father smokes a lot of Cuban cigars. That was all that was available." But man, I really fell in love with the Crown Heads uh, that I picked up in Canada, and I'm over here in Buffalo, New York, on a business trip, and and I want to pick up more cigars. And they walk into a humidor, and there's no Cubans, and I'm like, oh my God, look at Padron, look at Fuente, look at all this, and they're exposing themselves to these new brands to them, even though these brands are not new. And it's awesome to meet a person like that that has expanded their horizons. But it's just like wine. I mean, there's people out there who go, oh, I only drink French wine. I only drink Bordeaux. I only drink bourbon and not scotch. I only drink scotch and not bourbon. Only you're, whites, no yeah, reds, no You're wine, limiting no reds, yourself. You're limiting yourself. And uh, I think for a guy like you, a guy like me, discovery is fun. Yeah, I mean, even if it's bad, I still want to smoke it. Or, 100%. And it's not probably Actually, not going to be bad. It's just not going to be what I enjoy. So when I see a cigar get a great rating on any review side, You're like, hmm. I go, hmm, okay, all okay, right. But see. when they get a bad rating, I want to smoke it right away. Yeah, I, I want to know what they did. Because somebody... What did somebody not like about that yeah, cigar? Yeah, because somebody behind that cigar, more than likely, has probably been in the craft for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And there's a reason why they blended that cigar. And I want to know why that person didn't like that cigar. And a lot of times I disagree. I'll, I'll smoke and go, with this is a fantastic cigar. And so I love when a cigar gets a bad review because I love going out and smoking it and then making my own judgment on that cigar. That's... Yeah, I, I'd be curious to know if people in the comments will say anything as far as like uh, what what gets people more excited to smoke a cigar, a higher rating or a lower rating? Like if a new cigar came out from your favorite company and it got a high rating, are you more excited to smoke it or are you more excited to smoke it if it gets like a weird review? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I, maybe I'm. Um, there was a. You see, uh, we're 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 different because we're thinking about it differently. Yeah, we're yeah, thinking, yeah. okay, what about this blend in the yeah. particular order yeah. with this wrapper and binder made this cigar flavors not resonate with people? Oh, look, if I see a if I see a great cigar maker get a bad review on a cigar, I go that cigar maker. I know. I know that I've been doing this 21 years. I know that guy, and he would have to go out of his way to make a horrible cigar. So I got to try this thing. You know what I mean? Like, like there's no on a, way on a weak bender. Yeah, yeah. Like, what, what, what like, the hell's going on? And a lot of times it's just a it's bad just a batch reviewer. Of tobacco. Did it age worse than you originally thought when you rolled it yep. the first time? Yep. That's a big thing too. There's a lot yep. of times that you know you roll a cigar and you make it and then you age it and it doesn't taste anything like you wanted it. That's to That's part of the like. pro. That's that's kind of behind the curtains, right? Because we can work on a cigar, we work on it, we blend it, and we go. Oh, I like where this is going. Then we take our samples, we sit them in an aging room, we sit them there for 30 days, and then we revisit it. Yeah. Does it, has it gotten better? Has it maintained? Or has it completely lost what we liked about it? And that's the process of bringing a cigar to market, is there's a lot more than just sitting at a table, put a cigar together and go, yep, I like it, make it. It's a longer process of how are these tobaccos gonna age? And after these tobaccos have had an opportunity to lose some of their moisture, because when you're rolling cigars, mm. the humidity is much higher, yeah, yeah, yeah. because you need that flexibility. And you, and when that moisture comes out, 
it, how is that tobacco going to react? How is it going to taste at 70% humidity instead of 80% or 90% when it's being rolled? And sometimes you go, all right, you know what? I smoked it off the roller's table. It's so strong. And then you age it and you go, man, where did the strength go? Yeah. Okay, I need to do something. I need to revisit this blend to maintain whatever tobacco I need that cigar to be stronger or milder, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and that's that's the craftsmanship and the art of making a cigar. Yeah, it's... It, you know it, what it's it like, too? It can change it. It's like you make a pot of chili. <laughs> and you love that pot of chili. You go, this is the best chili I ever had in my life. I want to make and, it again. And then you sit it in your refrigerator for a day or two. And then you take it out and go, oh my God, this is even better. Because now all of those seasonings have had a chance to marry with each other. And so the pot of chili is always better the next day. Yeah, it's a little spicy. And cigars are the same way. You take them off the roller's table, you may like it, but the truth is if you sit in the aging room and it's good tobacco, it'll taste even better after it's had time to marry. We call that yep, marrying. I would agree with that. The filler, binder, and wrapper are all these different tobaccos. You freshly roll them together. They're all separate. But when you've aged them, uh, the, they start, the oils of the tobacco start coming out. They start mingling with the other oils, and then you have a truly harmonious blend, or it could go the other way and go, these tobaccos don't play well together. See, when people ask me about box press cigars and why they're different, mm -hmm. that's my, my two things I tell them are, there's a little bit less filler in it so mm -hmm. they can press it. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it might squeeze a little bit more oils out of the tobacco when they're when they're actually pressed in those um, those plates. Yeah, right? like, yeah. You know, the with trays. Tim Osgener, you know, he's got three core brands. Bosphorus is a hard press or trunk press, very, very squared off. You could play Django with them if you buy a box. If, and then we have the Aramas, which you're smoking, is Parejo, which means okay. straight-sided or round cigar. People will say just, you know, it's a round cigar, but the word is Parejo. And then in our new blend, the first shot is a soft press. Okay. So it's a cross between a Parejo and a, and a true box press cigar. It's okay. just a softer pressing of the cigar. It's not as hard pressed. So there's different ways to do it. And I do believe that when you hard press it, you are squeezing more of those oils together. And that's something a lot of people don't know is that you have to underfill it because when you go to press it, you have to have the ability for the airflow to get through. That's a great mm, little that's a great little okay. insider baseball there. Okay. And you know what what I don't like big ring gauges. Okay. But when a cigar is box pressed, I can smoke a bigger ring gauge because it's more comfortable because it's been ah, pressed. That's a good point. Yeah, so I would never smoke a six sixty. It's just not my thing. But when you press it, I could smoke a six sixty. Mm -hmm. But in a Parejo okay. I wouldn't smoke it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I smoke some 660s, but it's yeah. like I smoked a 990 the other day, and I was like, "Why didn't they taper this? Like, who, <laughs> who's got the mouth to put this in? Like, yeah, yeah. what kind of jaw are you unhinging mm -hmm. to smoke this cigar?" Um, so, I got I got one more question for yes, you, sir. and we'll wrap it up. What was the first cigar you ever smoked? Well, um, when I was young, I first dabbled in uh machine made cigars first so i dabbled with a uh, phillies uh, backwoods titan phillies titan and then i smoked a grenadier okay and and antoine cleopatra but when i actually got into premium cigars my first premium cigar was in 1996 it was an opus x it was the first year that the fuente fuente opus x came out i went and put 20 dollar bill on a tinder box in cincinnati ohio and said give me your most expensive cigar i didn't know what i was doing and he said, well, I just got these in from Fuente. They're a legacy company. They've been around a long time. This is their new release. It's a limited edition. It was the Perfection Number X. It was a number two torpedo size. And I took that to home. And with my brother and all of his friends, we went to the garage and we shared. I didn't know back then how to do it. We literally passed a cigar around like it was a joint in college or something. <laughs> but that was my first premium hand-rolled cigar. And then from there, I smoked Avos and, and, and got into all these different great cigars. And then 98, I fell in love with the brand CAO, yeah. who I eventually started working for, the Osgener family. And, uh, and, and the rest is history. But that's where I started. I Man, started with, with machine-made cigars opus, and then an Opus X. Okay. And, and you know, the truth is, at that age, it probably would have made me sick, because back then it was a very strong cigar yeah. but we smoked it passing it around so it, i never got dizzy off it my first was a rocky patel vintage 1990 oh very I, nice that i also bought from a tinder box very nice not very in cincinnati nice. though yeah, yeah, yeah uh i bought mine in uh south carolina very nice um at uh, myrtle beach mm. and then uh dude have you been tinder to jungle, box, jungle gyms down there i lived across the street when i oh, lived in my cincinnati God, you're spoiled bro if so, you know jungle gyms you know yeah so I, you know, I lived in Fairfield, Ohio, which was a suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio, and I literally lived across the street from Jungle Gyms. That was my local grocery store, a major retailer of ours on cigars. Dude, it people is, travel from far and wide. It's an amusement that, park, and you were across of a grocery the street. Store. I was literally across the street. Yeah, yeah. They were an account, and they were the place that we went shopping every day. Dude, that place is insane. It is. It is. It is. Uh, now they have two of them in Cincinnati.
Cincinnati. There's two now? There's two now. Oh, my God. And the God. second one is even bigger. Yeah. It's in East Gate, which is another area of Cincinnati. If it, just just look up Jungle Gyms, you'll you'll understand. Yeah. They, uh, this place you, is crazy. You can go to Jungle Gyms, buy a bag of food for your dog, imported cheese from <laughs> Greece. You can then buy uh, a cigar. You can buy a vodka that you've never seen before, and you can buy some rare cheese from a little village in Denmark. Yeah. All in the same place. Yep. Jungle Gyms is a very interesting place. They've been around really. How long have they been around? Well, they have been around. I want to say since the '80s, technically, but really '90s is where they took off because okay. the owner Jim. Uh, Jungle Jim himself, he started selling vegetables on the side that's of the right. road. That's right, he drove to Florida Fairfield. and bought oranges and then resold them in Ohio. Yep, and that's so I remember as a kid, <laughs> you know, him being on a corner selling stuff. And then it turned into one little building, another building, and now it's an empire. Okay. Yeah, good guys, good guys. And and he's a and he's a diehard cigar guy, too, so that's awesome. All right, last question, and yes. we'll wrap it up yes. now. Skyway Chili, yes or no? Yes. In fact, I think Skyline Chili is an American treasure. Oh, yeah, I said Skyway. Shame on me. Skyline or Golly. Gold Star. Yeah, okay. Go, Gold Star okay. and Skyline. It's like uh, it's like the Crips and Bloods, okay? <laughs> Most people don't cross. Here it's like the Philbertos and Umbertos. There you and go. Bilio-Bertos. There you go. That's an that's an, uh, Arizona Air talk. Yeah. yeah, there's literally like six different Bertos. Yeah, what well, Bertos? Well, there's a lot of Bertos. So, yeah. but in Cincinnati, we also have like Blue Ash Chili. We have Camp Washington. So there's more independent as well. Yeah. But my family love Gold Star and Skyline. We love them both. I grew up with kids that that family owned Gold Star. So I always it was one of my first jobs as a kid. And then I worked okay. at Skyline as a kid as well. Um, but my, I I think it's truly one of the treasures. When you come to Cincinnati, you have to have a three way. We're going to end it on that, guys. <laughs> Go to Cincinnati and have a three-way. Yeah. With that, guys, this has been the Zeal Cigar Review. This has been Miguel from Crown Heads, the national sales rep. And we're out of here like last year. Peace. Cheers. <laughs>